Hi, I guess we're in a little bit different format today, right? You're, you're kind of used to seeing me in the front of the classroom. You know, well, okay, I've done this kind of thing for probably 10 years now, maybe even longer than that, where I've been making videos for online classes. So this is nothing new for me, okay? Um, and so I'm in my living room, um, <clears throat> and we'll talk about this in a minute and why I'm here. But I wanted to talk about something else first. If you remember the first day we met this semester, I had you draw a grid of a whole week, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and plot it all out. And I told you that that's what you should do when you start college next year, okay? Well, this is a good time for you to do that. And I'll tell you why I'm saying this. Um, I think five of your essays didn't appear Tuesday until after 9 o'clock at night, and one of them was after 11 o'clock at night, okay? And what that shows to me is that somebody didn't plan their day out, and then they thought, oh, I have to get this done. Now, I may be wrong with that, but that's what I'm guessing, okay? This is the time for you to plan out your days so that you get things done, because otherwise you're going to waste a lot of time and then put yourself in a crunch to try to get this done, this done, this done, this done. So this is a time for you to be practicing what I already told you you should do at the beginning of the year when you start full-time college next fall, okay? Hopefully all of you understand what I'm saying so you don't waste a lot of time. Okay, so every so often you'll see me lean forward like I just did because if I'm not moving enough, my screen darkens, okay? And if I don't uh, hit the little pad on there quickly, then it stops. So, and I'm also using my hands a good little bit just to try to indicate motion because then it tends not to darken quite so quickly. So don't be put off by my hands and they aren't as big as they look on the camera. They're just, you know, they're closer to the camera than I am, obviously, because they're on the ends of my arms. And that's why my hands look so big. Okay, so... <clears throat> What we'll be doing, and I put this in print, but I want to make sure that you all understand this, is I will be putting up a lesson for you a Thursday or Friday each week with an assignment. That assignment will be due on Tuesday, okay? And you will be putting that assignment on Moodle the same way you put this past Tuesday, the way you put your assignment on Moodle. You can do it earlier than that. That's okay. You know, today is Thursday. You can do this Thursday or Friday or Saturday or something. You don't have to wait till Tuesday to do it, okay? Plot out your time so you get that planned for yourself. Okay, then uh, between Tuesday and Thursday, you are to go back onto Moodle and read the essays of at least two of your classmates and write comments on those essays, okay? On, on at least two. And I want you to write approximately five sentences in comment. I don't want you to just say, oh yeah, I agree with what you said. If you do that, say yes, and here were the points that you made and I agree with those, or I disagree. Here's my frame of reference. And it's okay to disagree with somebody because we've been stressing the point all semester long that literature really only means for the reader what it means for the reader. And so you are not going to interpret a piece of literature the exact same way as somebody else, okay? So uh, between Tuesday and Thursday, I need those posted on Thursday um, by 6 o'clock on Thursday, okay? I need those posted each week. So again, by Tuesday... Um, Get, get your essays posted, and let's say Tuesday at 6 o'clock, get your essays posted, and then between Tuesday and Thursday at 6 o'clock, write those comments, and each Thursday or Friday, you'll find a new lesson on there, okay? So everybody understand how we're going forward, okay? Good, good. <clears throat> okay, so we already know a little bit about Nathaniel Hawthorne. We talked about him some when we read The Birthmark. And if you remember that story, it is a very intense story, okay? 
Hawthorne's work is generally intense. Is everything that he wrote intense? Actually, no, not so. But almost everything is, and kind of the purpose behind it is all very intense. It's a reflection of his life. He grew up in puritanical Salem, Massachusetts. Now, he was born uh, 112 years after the witchcraft trial of 1692, okay? Um, and you all know all about the witchcraft trials. And if you don't, I put information on Moodle about the witchcraft trials so that you can understand a little more of where Hawthorne is coming from. But it's also important for you to read that information because it's relevant to this week's uh, story that you're reading, which is Young Goodman Brown. Okay, it, it helps set the scene for Young Goodman Brown as well. It helps you understand better what's going on in Young Goodman Brown. Okay, now Young Goodman Brown is set in Puritan Salem, Massachusetts. Okay, and an important factor is, and I mentioned this in the lesson online, that the people came there. Uh, you know, actually, they were pretty much descendants from the Mayflower. Okay, and when they came here. Uh, a lot of them had a, they all had a really hard time, but half of them died that first year, many from starvation, okay? And here's how hard up they were. Those people were bankers, you know, they were businessmen, they were things like that. They weren't laborers, they weren't carpenters, they weren't fishermen. So actually, when they landed uh, on November 11th in uh Plymouth, Massachusetts, they could see fish jumping out of the water in Cape Cod. They could see that, but they had no idea how to catch them. The Indians showed them how to do that, the Native Americans, okay? And when they first landed, you know, within a few days they saw the Native Americans going around and, and taking bunches of corn and burying it. And the reason they were doing that was that was to be their seed corn for the next year. Okay. Well, you know, the, the people who had come to Plymouth didn't, uh, didn't really understand, but they saw this was, as a food source, and so they were digging up this corn and cooking it and eating it. Okay. And, of course, it got to be a staple in their diet pretty quickly. Uh, and you know what happens when you eat too much corn, right? People generally get dysentery or diarrhea or, you know, something unpleasant like that. So in that first year... Half the people died. That's how tough things were in Plymouth Colony, okay? So um, they, they changed their way of doing things, and, and they took on the philosophy of work hard, get ahead for the greater glory of God. Not for me, but for God. When I succeeded, God was showing his favor upon me. And, and why is that important? Because they had come to practice their religion, and so they made their religion a, a basic part of it. Well, they also broke their society up into, instead of being an all-for-one, one-for-all society, they changed it into a situation where each family got its own plot of land, okay? And so when you know your family is going to survive based on your efforts, you're going to work a lot harder than when you, when you feel like you're working for the whole community. It's just human nature. We're going to work harder for ourselves and our family than for everybody. And so once they did that, a year after they were there, they started to thrive. And the more they thrived, the less God played in their lives. And, and you've all done this, okay? We've all done this. You have a big exam tomorrow. You're not ready. You do some cramming, and then you say, please, God, this one time, please help me. I'll never do this again, okay? And then you take the exam, and you pass or fail, and then within a very short period of time, you go back into the same habit you had before. Okay, so the role of God becomes important when you, when you really need him at that minute, but we forget that we need him every minute, you know, and, and so it, it affects us. Anyway, okay, so the society started doing really well, and so the role of God had kind of faded in their lives, okay, and, and so um, they needed to maintain the appearance of God being important, and that's what this story is all about. That's a big part of what Goodman Brown is all about, is... Um, from Hawthorne's point of view, the puritanical society, by the time it got to 
you know, beyond about 1650, when things were really rolling well, they were very hypocritical. Okay? They wanted to maintain the appearances of, but really the role of God had faded a great deal in their lives. And so he really accentuates this because he has Goodman Brown go to a witch's Sabbath. And what's a witch's Sabbath? It is a devil worship ceremony. Okay? And, and so we see Goodman Brown head off into the forest, and his wife says, where are you going? I wish you'd stay here with me. And there's a hint in there, too. That, that's an important thing, okay? Because she said, this one night above all others, please stay here with me. So something's going on with her. Goodman Brown has said, yeah, I've made an appointment in the forest. I have to go keep it. Have faith in me. I'll be back tomorrow. Ironically, her name is Faith, but we'll talk about symbolism next week, not this week, so we're not terribly concerned about the symbolism in her name as we go on, okay? Um, but anyway, Goodman Brown goes into the forest, meets a creature, which meets, meets an individual whom, whom we quickly get to realize is the devil, okay? The, you know, the ultimate liar, the prince of darkness, whatever you want to call him, okay? It's the devil, and, and we know he's a liar, and so does Goodman Brown actually experience all the things that he thinks he's experiencing in the forest, or is the devil just making him think that, because again, the devil's the ultimate liar, because he experiences some dramatic people there, and you'll see that in the story, okay? Ultimately, he gets to the Witch of Sabbath, but before he gets there, when we first see Faith, she's got pink ribbons in her hair. Faith is his wife. He's in the forest trying to decide whether he wants to go to the Witch's Sabbath or not after he's met these people or supposedly met these people on the way. And then he's, he's trying to decide, and then he hears this noise overhead, and these pink ribbons come floating down. Naturally, he thinks of Faith. And, and he hears these sounds overhead, and it sounds like Faith's voice. You know, witches fly on brooms. Okay, so... Is faith going the same place that he was supposed to go? Well, maybe. Hawthorne had kind of foreshadowed that right in the very beginning, right? This one night above all others, please stay here with me. Okay? And, and then he, he becomes something other than who he is. Okay? Because Hawthorne says, The fiend in his own shape is less hideous than when he rages in the breast of man. Page 314 is, is a really powerful page. Okay? So... Uh, uh, Goodman Brown just becomes something else. He becomes, in a sense, the devil himself raging through the forest. Okay, the devil has taken control of him, you know, um, and and so he becomes really something amazing. Okay, um, and and then that that whole page is all about his his thinking about faith and what's he going to do and how awful all this all is. That's page three fourteen. Uh, and then we get to the Witch's Sabbath, and um, there, there really is, is a critical line when um, um, the devil says, Now are ye undeceived. Evil is the nature of mankind. Whoa! Okay, is evil the nature of mankind? I hope not. I don't know. But you can think about that in the story. I told you, intense, intense, intense. Hawthorne is intense. This story is intense. But as I say in the notes, it's Lent, it's time for us to be intense, it's time for self-examination. And this story can cause us to do a little bit of that too, so there's more to it than you might think meets the eye. On 317, after the Witch's Sabbath is, is over, there's a line that says, Had Goodman Brown fallen asleep in the forest and only dreamed a wild dream of a witch meeting? Big line, okay, and actually you're going to write about that this week, you know. That's, that's what the question is going to be about, is that particular line. So that appears in your book on, on 317. So anyway, um, don't let the language put you off. I address that uh, in, in Moodle also. Um, it's not Old English. It's just a little previous, s some terms that have fallen out of play. You know, prithy means uh, pray thee or what do you think? Uh, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and he uses thee and thou, but we know what those things mean. And you know, um, we, we have a living language, and I'm sure if you really think about it, you can think about words whose meanings have ch has changed, words whose meanings have changed from the time you were 10 years old 
till now in those seven or eight years in between how things have changed. I can give you a quick example. It's a longer period, but, you know, when I was a kid, text meant a book, okay? Now, text means this, as well as a book, okay? So, you know, language changes. So this isn't Old English. It's Modern English, but some of these words are words that have fallen out of usage. So don't be put off by them. This is a story that you read slowly, carefully, intensely, because it's an intense story, okay? Uh, so enjoy it. Uh, and if you have questions, you know how to get me. It's all on Moodle. Um, you know, so get in touch with me. Feel free. I got a text this morning already from one, from one of your fellow students. Um, so, you know, never a problem to do that. Okay? Take care, and we'll talk to you soon. And be safe.